So this morning, I'm going to challenge you this morning. Some of you won't like some of the stuff I'm going to say. But, you know, there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. But one thing we do need is we need the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And we've confused the conviction of the Holy Spirit with condemnation because, you know, we're, we've become a, or well, the world's become a, a world of um, God is love, God is love, God is love, and He is. But His principal character is holiness. And out of His holiness comes love. And so I want to challenge you this morning with some things, and I'm not saying it to pinpoint anyone, to upset anyone, or anything like that, because we come to church one way, right? I came to church with addictions as a sinner, but I left a different way, amen? And so we're walking with people because it's a process that God has in our life to make us like Him, amen? And so I'm going to challenge you this morning, and then I'm going to show you exactly who you are called to be. And so we're going to open the Word and do that. So I want to just start in Daniel 7.25, and I was just reading this, and I don't really know why I've got it here this morning, because I almost preached on it, because it's an incredible passage of Scripture if you go through that chapter. But Daniel 7.25 says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. Who's that? That's us. And to think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and a times and a dividing of time. And so within this whole passage of Daniel 7, what you see is the complete manifestation of the devil coming against everything that is godly. Isn't that taking place already? Coming to usurp and undermine everything that our Lord Jesus Christ has paid for on the cross, even to the point of trying to change times and laws, to undermine those things that are right, those things that are good, calling them evil, calling evil good, good evil. You know what's going on, guys. Not forgetting that Satan can only do this because God allows this judgment, this tribulation to come upon the earth. Now, in every past revival that is taking place, and we know that the, the church is heading into another move of God, there's no doubt about that. The world will move, is heading into a move of God, but every move, significant move of God that has taken place in times past, there's always been a move of repentance just prior to a move of God. However, this coming move of God, and you may not like this, is going to be birthed out of judgment. It's going to be birthed out of judgment that is coming upon the earth. Because what is taking, going to take place in these days to come is the greatest move of God that the world has ever seen and ever taken place and ever will be, amen? It is the final ingathering of the souls. It is the conclusion of everything. And so everything is going to be shaken to a measure that it has never been shaken like before. Amen? Amen? But on the other side of the coin, because there's always two sides of the coin, the greatest glory of God will be seen upon the earth that has never been seen before and never will be again. Until the conclusion of time, that is. Now, last week, as you know, we've been dealing with some, I I, I hate it, affirmity. (laughs) I hate it. You know, we we believe in healing in this church, amen? We've seen miracles of God. And yet here we are struggling with things that are going on, and I don't have all the answers. And it reminds me of Brian when he shared here, and he told us that when he was in Africa and someone threw a dead body up on the stage, and he went to pray for them quietly, and the Lord said, no, you you declare my word with boldness, and he did, and he raised that body from the dead in front of thousands of people. But then he tried to raise his own wife from the dead and his own son who was suffering with cancer and didn't see it come to pass. Do we have questions? Absolutely. But we remain standing, amen? We do what we know to do and we don't move from that place. And in doing so, we're honoring God and his word, amen? And so last week, we were struggling with stuff and we're trying to stand and it's robbed our time, it's robbed my prayer life, it's robbed our rest, We've been tired and all that sort of stuff. And you know what? I haven't really been too happy about it. 
<laughs> I'm looking forward to when Satan is under our feet completely. It's coming. Hallelujah. However, each night, well, not each night, but a few nights there as I laid in bed, the Lord was asking me the same question. And you know, when the Lord asks you a question, it bothers you. I don't know if you've experienced it. And the question God keep ask, kept asking me, I, I mean, I, I was sleep deprived and I just wanted to sleep and I laid down on my pillow and I felt the Lord was just asking me this question and he would say to me, what is it going to take for my people to walk with me? You try and get some sleep when the Lord speaks that. What is it going to take for my people to walk with me? And I didn't answer the Lord because I didn't want to answer wrong. And so I've pondered this. I've pondered this and I've had all sorts of thoughts and then next thing I know I'm laying in bed like preaching to myself. Right? Repenting again. Lord, have mercy on me. And even when I share this question, it bothers me. It grips my heart. What's it going to take for my people to walk with me? And it's not just someone saying this. This is God speaking it. And it convicted me. It convicted me in my own walk with the Lord. And I came to realize the answer that God was trying to show me. That the answer that it's what's going to take for us to walk with God, how we're meant to be walking with God, is actually judgment upon the earth. This is what it's going to take. And it's the only way that God is able to bring forth his bride is through much trial and much testing as a catalyst to cause us to get on our knees and begin to cry out to God. Because his church is meant to be a house of prayer. I don't know about you guys, but when, I, when I'm going through my week, sometimes I struggle to have the time to pray. You've got kids going on, and you go, Lord, I'm going to spend some time with you. Next thing you know, there's a blood nose. There's something else going on. There's some dramas happening. And next thing, you, your time disappears. And you think, well, what happened, Lord? But God's calling us into intimacy in this hour. You know, we think of that scripture, just to sidetrack a minute, where Jesus, his disciples came to him, and they said, Lord, why can't we... Um, in my own words, deliver this man. And he said, this only comes out through much prayer and fasting, right? And you see, Jesus was able to do it. Why? What was Jesus saying in that? What Jesus was saying is that was his lifestyle. So we did a bit of prayer and fasting this week, but that was Jesus' lifestyle of prayer and fasting. He was always ready. He was always walking with the Father. And you see, this is what it's going to take in these days that we're going to walk through is a life of prayer and fasting and intimacy before our God. Amen? And so, <clears throat> as I pondered this question each night, <coughs> excuse me, the Lord was showing me the condition of his children and it grieved me. And he showed me all the, all the people and things and stuff I've heard about, you know, I'm talking about people sleeping together, people living together, people bound to porn, distracted by entertained, just wanting to be entertained with things. There's people walking with offenses and unforgiveness and bitterness and all this stuff, and it's in the house of God. And it grieved me, church, because the Lord was showing me his heart. You know what God has said his word? You know, this word, we forget about it. But this word is becoming the most precious thing that I have, right? It should always be, but more so. And this word that God has given us and the principles upon this word are actually there to protect us, to keep us, to keep us in the day of trouble that is coming, to keep us so when we go through difficulties, we're able to stand and endure and overcome. Amen? And I've been convicted with this same question in my own life. And you see, God's word is like, you know, you've got the barriers on the road. You've got the boundaries on the side of the road. So if you happen to lose a bit of focus, you knock into the barrier, but you don't go off-road, right? 
And that is what the Word of God is. The principles of God's Word are like the barriers of a road to protect us. They stop the car from going outside of the road, outside of the boundaries. And they also show the way ahead when it's hard to see. You can see and navigate because of the barriers along the road. And you know this is the way to go because it's safe. And so God, this is why God has given us his principles and his word to actually protect us and to keep us. We know the scripture in Matthew 7 13, it says, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go and buy it, but narrow is the gate, and difficult, did you hear that? Difficult is the way. You think a Christian walk is easy? It's hard. You want to remain standing on the Word of God. It's difficult. There's so much stuff to pull us and tear us away and lead us apart and separate us and cause division and and all this sort of stuff. And the only way through is a close work with the Lord Jesus Christ and a life of prayer and fasting. Difficult is the way which leads to life. But you know what? Jesus has given us a way that leads to life. It's His way. But then it says there are few, few who find it. I don't like those words. I want it to be many. But God says it's few. And so what is coming is judgment upon the earth. Why? So that repentance can come forth. And there'll be fruit, meat for repentance. What's that talking about when the scripture says that? It's talking about the evidence of a true heart that is turned towards God. Turned around. That's what repentance means, to turn around. But we can easily say the right things, but there needs to be the demonstration of a life that's laid down towards God. Amen? Because God's in the business of restoration. So no one's too far gone. God restores. Amen? Because, you know, this church, or every church, has got a ministry to the world. We're called to the world. Yet the church is an actual, actually has a desperate need for the hand of God to be upon it so that it can be a representation of heaven here on earth. Amen? And everywhere I read at present and research and everywhere I look at the moment, emails and things like that, I see that everyone is saying that it's not a matter of if there's going to be a war that happens, it's a matter of when that's going to happen now. So everything has been ramped up. And um, I don't know if you realize, but two days ago, Germany has just declared war against Russia. You can Google that. I find it strange because I thought they had an alliance. So um, check it out for yourself. Or hopefully I'm wrong with that. Hopefully it's a false flag. But apparently Russia is waiting for German Germany to put their tanks onto Ukraine soil, and then when that happens, legally, Germany Germany has broken what is called the Potsdam Agreement, and then everything's going to break loose if that takes place. And so we're seeing all sorts of stuff um, happening. We know Zechariah 14 talks about, uh, or gives the picture of a what is considered a nuclear war in the Bible. And so everything is happening. The stage is set. In fact, Russia have been on high alert for months now. They've already done their protocols and everything. And apparently, they just if they need to launch, they can launch from, uh, in, uh, from sorry, launch detection to impact 75 seconds. That's obviously probably from a submarine. And they have hypersonics that go Mach 18. Well, the US has got nothing to counteract that because they've got no bullets at the moment anyway. And so the uh, US is 20 minutes to launch, to go through their protocols. So I've heard. Anyway, that's just food for thought because the point of the matter is the whole stage is set and everything is getting stirred. The whole world, the Bible tells us, is groaning under the weight of sin. But you know what? The whole world is also groaning for what? For the manifestation of the sons of God. Who's that? Us. Amen. So the whole earth is waiting for that. 
for God to perfect his bride and for us all to become manifest with the glory of God because the world has not seen it. And so the whole world was groaning to see this thing take place that we might function as God has called us to walk. Amen? Isn't that exciting? And so this morning, I want to show you who you are and I want to show you the value that God has placed upon you because God has not, has not cut any corners and he has placed the highest call upon you. And it's quite amazing. I shared this last year on our Tuesday night, but I felt the Lord prompt me to share this again because a lot of you guys haven't heard this stuff. And so I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians 15. We shared this about two weeks ago, and here we are again, the same passages of Scripture. 1 Corinthians 15, 42. It says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. How be it that which was not, sorry, how be it that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural and afterwards that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthly. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthly, such are they also that are earthly. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And um, where are we? 49. And as we have bore the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. I love that. Amen. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, never doth corruption inherit incorruption. And we're just going to scroll down. We're not going to read through the last trumps and all that sort of stuff that it mentions next. We go down to verse 57. It says, but thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, how is our victory had? Through Jesus Christ. Amen. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. So it tells me that if I'm steadfast and if I'm un, uh, unmovable upon the principles, upon the word of God, then guess what? I will always be abounding. You see, these are principles here. Abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. Don't ever think you've sown a seed and it's wasted. Amen? So the first Adam was a living soul. The second or the last Adam, which is Jesus Christ, was made a quickening spirit or a quickened spirit. And it's very interesting in looking at this passage of Scripture, we see the Bible tells us that first it is the natural, then the spiritual. And in reading this passage of text, this is a picture of Jesus Christ and the church. For example, Jesus was sown and he was dishonored, yet he raised in glory. Amen? He was beaten and he was sown in weakness of strength, yet he raised in power. His natural body was destroyed, yet raised a spiritual body. He was born on earth, yet bearing the image of God. He was fully man, yet fully God. And sin and death was swallowed up in victory. And so we see a similar picture of our lives being transformed and changed when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And through the power of Jesus Christ, everything begins to change in our lives, right? When you receive the Lord, did things begin to change? <laughs> man, it should have. Don't forget you're saved again. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> and it's actually impossible to remain the same. 
It's actually impossible to have a born-again experience, an encounter with God, and be the same. So everything begins to change. God began to convict me. He began to say, hey, you need to change this in the life. You need to cut this off your life. You need to pick this up. You need to start pursuing that. You need to cut off these relationships, whatever it might be, and change begin to happen in my life. Amen? And this is why you see people, they come to the Lord, and you just love them, and they start making these changes themselves because the Holy Spirit is at work. <clears throat> the thinking, the speaking, the mindset, the way we view things, our attitudes, everything begins to change because of the high value that Christ has placed upon you. Yet there's many times, probably like yourself, I've wanted to give up. You know, we sometimes can waver in our thinking. We're not meant to. This is why God wants to, us to gird up the loins of our mind. That we might have a strong mind upon the things of the Lord and not be influenced by the things of the world. But again, in verse 58, we see that God says to us, I want you to be steadfast and unmovable. To what? To God's word and his principles. Remember the barriers of the road? In other words, don't compromise God's word by the way you live. Do not undermine the word of God that's actually there to establish you. See, the establishment of God's word in your life is through and within those principles, obedience to his word. Why? So that you might be able to go forward and fulfill his word upon your life and his word upon the earth. Amen. For this purpose, the Son of God was made manifest to destroy the works of the devil. That was the commission that Jesus was given, and it's the commission he's given the church. And it's the same as Moses' life. I'm not going to go into that. But you see, the last part of his life, he was a, he was a deliverer to set the captives free. Because the Holy Spirit has anointed him to go forth and do that. This is the call of the church. So it's going to happen in the days to come. So God is preparing us for that. You know, even being here today, it's a principle. This is God's command that we fellowship together. So we come together as a family. So we're able to build each other up. We're able to worship together. We're able to encourage one another, pray for one another. That can't happen on your own. That's why it says do not forsake the fellowship of the fellowship together. And that word forsake, I mentioned the other week, it's a military term, and it's talking about going AWOL. Don't be missing an action. And so we're not here today because of feelings. Oh, I don't feel like going to church today. But you know what? If I'm honest, there's been plenty of times in the last 20 odd years I haven't felt like going to church. <laughs> Come on. There's times where I'm tired and it's difficult and I've got to set up and, you know, do music and things like that. But you know what? I do it unto the Lord. I'm going to do it, Lord. Help me. Give me the strength. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Because it's a principle and I want to, I want to live by his word, by his principles, not by my feelings. My feelings have to take second place. And so, it's, yeah, it's a sacrifice sometimes. The Bible even says it's a sacrifice of praise. Sometimes you might not really feel like worshiping, but as you start to worship, as you start to sing, something changes. Something changes in your countenance. This morning, I just wanted to keep worshiping. I just want to oh, forget the message. Let's just worship the Lord. Let's honor him. Amen. I just want to exalt his name. I want to give him glory. I want to give him praise from my lips. Amen. <clears throat> so God is wanting all of you, and Satan is, yet Satan is so busy trying to destroy people's lives, but God says, back off, Satan. I have way, made a way for my people that they may abound. How? How do we abound? By staying within the principles of God's word. Otherwise, you're going to go around the mountain and you're going to learn the slow way like I did. So you should be thanking me today because I'm helping you so you don't have to go around the mountain like I did. Amen? 
God said that it hasn't even entered our heart, the things that God has prepared for those who love him. You see, it's the wisdom of God to conceal a matter. How many people know that, that God's into hiding things, right? There's hidden treasure all over the city. Some of the homeless, the addicted, the broken, the ones that the world has written off and said they're not good enough, or that you're a good for nothing, they were very well may be the next deacons, the next leaders, the next pastors, the next people of influence that God's calling in this time. Because we don't know the plans and the calling that God has on people's lives, but we do know that God created all men and they were created for his good purpose. Amen. Matthew 13, 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has so he can buy that field. Wow. Will we lay it all down for him? So this treasure that I'm talking about is the many souls that are hidden in this in the city. And in the days ahead, some of us are going to stumble upon some of them. I say that because in my experience, I don't know what I'm doing half the time. I'm just saying, oh, Lord, help me. And, and then God just gives you a God encounter. Of course, we go out and be intentional. But it's God that does it. Amen. <clears throat> the ones outside the church that we've been called to reach. The God appointments, the God opportunities. And I've said this many, many times. When Jesus saw Peter, what did he see? When Jesus saw Peter, he saw a rock. Remember Jesus, uh, sorry, Peter's name means rock. And that's what Jesus saw. Why? Because God always starts with the end in mind. God sees beyond what we see. He saw Peter and didn't see a rat bag, even though he was. He saw the potential of who he was in Christ Jesus. And I want to show you something this morning about God hiding stuff. Some of you have heard this before. We're going to read it from Ephesians 5.30. And it says, <clears throat> for we are members of his body. Wow, that's awesome. Of his flesh and of his bones. Wow. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. No separation. Right? This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Interesting. It's a great mystery speaking or concerning Christ and the church. So we need to go back to the seed book of Genesis where God had the end in mind right from the beginning. Okay? So remember, Jesus always had you in mind. You were always the plan, and you were always the intention of his heart. So we're reading from Genesis 2, verse 21. And it says, And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam. And he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord had taken from the man, he made into a woman, and he brought it to the man. And Adam said, and there's some dad jokes to be had here. <laughs> oh, they're terrible, aren't they? Have you heard them? <clears throat> And Adam said, whoa, man, whoa, man, woman, man, woman, right? And that's where they got the word woman from. Anyway, it's terrible, I know. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now, when Eve was created out of Adam, he actually gets up and prophesies. We just read it. This is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh because she was taken out of man. So Adam prophesied because this very event is a picture of Christ and the church becoming one flesh. So let's move on to the New Testament with Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. John 19, 34. What does it say? But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, 
and immediately blood and water came out. Now, without sound, sounding crude, blood and water is always a sign of birth. It's what happens in the natural. So the first Adam, his side was opened to bring forth life. He named it woman. It was his bride, his helper, and assistant. And now we have a similar picture of Jesus. Jesus is referred to as the second Adam. His side was also opened on the cross. Blood and water came out representing life. He brought forth life, a sign of birth. So first it was natural with the first Adam. Now it is spiritual with Jesus Christ. Now stay with me as we take this a little bit further. Matthew 27, 9. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, And they took the 30 pieces of silver, the value of him who was pierced, whom they of the children of Israel priced. Talking about Jesus, right? Jesus was valued at 30 pieces of silver or 30 shekels. Now get this. If you go into Leviticus 27.3, if your valuation is of a male from 20 years old to 60 years old, then your valuation shall be 50 shekels of silver, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. If it is a female, then your valuation shall be 30 shekels. Did you get that? 30 pieces of silver is the price of a woman, a female sheep. 30 pieces of silver. A man was 50. So the hidden treasure inside of Christ was the church. And the birthing of the bride of Christ came from his side on the cross of Calvary with the payment being the same amount paid for a woman because you're the bride of Christ. And he birthed the church out of his side. Remember the scripture. This is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman. It is the bride of Christ because she was taken out of man. Isn't that amazing? This is who you are. Do you know that your value, because of what I've just shown you this morning, your value is actually Christ himself. There is nothing of a higher value in all of creation. Nothing. Nothing. And this is the value that God's placed upon you, himself. See, it changes things when we look at one another now. It changes things when we look at our friends and our neighbors and all that sort of stuff. Because if we don't value them with the value of Christ, then we need to get in our knees in repentance before God. Because that's the value God's put upon them. Amen? It's gone very quiet. <clears throat> and so, because of this, when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're now called a son. Amen? Amen? We become adopted into the family of God and called a son. Bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. So God has made a way for you to actually be family. Incredible. Bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, family, son. His blood running through our veins, amen. Birth from his side. And so the Bible speaks about that there's two types of sons and what type of son you are is entirely up to you. You can be a son of God or you can be a son of Belial. And that word Belial means devil. Two sons. You get the choice. And so it's through this process of sonship that God raises you up to be a mature son. Right? Just like a, you start off as an infant and you go on into maturity and all through the word of God you see this process that God has of maturity. I think it's in 1 John where it says, I speak to you little children, I speak to you young men, and I speak to you fathers. Now if you're a child, 
you're a son. If you're a granddad, you're a son. And the reason I'm using the word son, I explained this last week, the other week, is because we are called the church of the firstborn, spiritual Israel. And so the custom was that the firstborn son received a double portion inheritance. And so this is the inheritance that God has for his church. It's a double portion. Amen. And so he uses the word son, but the word son obviously includes sons and daughters. But it uses the masculine in the word of God so we don't miss the principle of God about inheritance. And so in 1 John, I speak to you little children, I speak to you young men, I speak to you fathers. Each one of those is a son. And if you look at the Greek word for an infant, it is the word napios. It's where we get the word nappy from, and where we get get the word, um, sorry, napkin, and then we get the word nappy from. And so we start off as a babe in Christ and nappies. That's what the very word means for son, for infant. Then as we get older, We go on into our teenage years and we can get a little bit prideful and think we know it all and we've got it all worked out because we know a few things and God's used us a little bit and all that sort of stuff. And the word for son there is called technon. It's where we get the word technician. We begin to be able to do some things and and start dividing the word of God. But God doesn't want us staying there as a technon. He wants us to grow up to be a father, but the Bible says there's not many fathers. And the word there is the word huios, and it means to be in his likeness and in his image. Basically, we represent him. He looks like us, and we look like him. And so there's a process that God has for us to go on into maturity as a son. But unfortunately, and I don't even like saying this, most of the church today are napios. They're a son of nappies. And yet God wants us to be mature sons. Amen. You see, even just to repeat what I shared last week, when Jesus, for him it came by way of baptism, just as it does for us. And see, when he was baptized, what did the father say? This is my son, with whom I'm well pleased. So there's affirmation. Then it says the Holy Spirit drove him into the wilderness. Why? For testing. Because if you want to call yourself a son of God, then Satan's going to test you to see whether you really are a son or not. And remember the scriptures, it says, if you are a son, turn this stone to bread. If you are a son, jump off this high place. If you are a son, bow down and worship me. And so after he went through testing, his sonship was tested. There was a process of grooming him and raising him up into someone that God could use powerfully. You see, his ministry hadn't started then, right? And he went through all these things, the process of a son. And then it goes on, he comes out of that and he says, I bestow a kingdom upon you as one was bestowed upon me. So what's that talking about now? Now he can operate in in the authority of a son, as a son. See, he didn't get it straight from the beginning. There's a process. And see, a lot of people, they talk about, and I only learned this recently, the disciples, and they say, oh, but you know, God just used simple fishermen and he called them. Did he? Is that what he did? Is that what he did? Do you realize that in the Jewish culture that uh, when, when a young man came to What's it called? Bar mitzvah? Bar mitzvah? Is that it? By that time, they were able to recite the first five books of the Bible. Did you realize that? So these fishermen that we think are simple fishermen that know nothing, they weren't babies. They knew their word. And God called them. See, God doesn't use novices. He raises up sons. Amen. There's a process that God has to see where he can trust you with his word because souls are at stake. To see whether he's going to see someone who's faithful. To see if he's going to see someone who's going to live within these boundaries. To see if he's going to be someone who's going to honor his name and honor his word. And so he takes his people through a process of sonship. Amen. Hallelujah. 
Napios, Technon, Huios. Exodus 19.4, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and now I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests. Did you see that? This is who we are, the picture of priesthood. We're called a kingdom of priests. You might read in your words saying kings and priests, but there's one king. We are a kingdom of priests because we minister unto him. Kingdom of priests, the holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. And so Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before them all these words which the Lord commanded him. Then all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Wow. You see, your gifting gives you the ability to fulfill your call, your anointing gives you the purpose. Thank you, Lord, you've anointed me. I'm going to lay hands on the sick, right? But never let it be at the expense of your character. That's the most important thing. So you've got both the gifting, you've got the purpose, and can I say this morning, you've also got the value. Amen? You're valued. So in the days to come, the whole world is going to tell you that you're worthless and you're useless and you're good for nothing, and they're going to oppose the church. But that's not what God says. Amen? You are valued, valued, highly valued, amen? You're a bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. Do you understand that this morning, church? I want to encourage you in this. You know, I started off bringing a little bit of a challenge of what the Lord's been saying to me. What's it going to take to walk with him? And, you know, today, friends, when we, we, get to make, we get to come before the Lord and say, Lord, forgive me. We get to come before the Lord and say, Lord, change me. We get to come before the Lord and say, Lord, search me. Search my heart. Teach me, Lord. What do you want me to pick up, Lord? What do you want me to lay down? What do you want me to change in my life? See, a lot of times we don't do this, but if we really, really want to walk with the Lord, we need to put our life before the Lord and be the, be that, let him be the potter and us be the clay. Amen? And let him do those things. And you know what? Sometimes it's uncomfortable, but what comes out of it is something beautiful. Amen? And what God wants to do in this hour and this time is going to be something beautiful. But he's reminding us again, we've got to be steadfast and unmovable. And then we might abound in the things that God's called us to do. 